please remain standing as we invite Reverend Albanon Lewis of the Spring Adams Moravian Church to bless this morning's proceedings. Good morning. The scripture says it is good, it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come this morning and we pause recognizing that you are creator and sustainer. Recognizing that you created us fearfully and wonderfully and you created us in your image and in your likeness. That means, Lord God, that we are able to love. It means that we can care for others. It means that we are intelligent. It means that we are creative. It means that we can build, Lord, all gifts that are needed for this particular exercise today. We offer these gifts to you and pray, Lord, that you will cause them to come to full use in this consultation this morning. Even as we consider the thought of creating uh, health insurance for persons, Lord God, we thank you that you have built that in us, the ability to love and care and to have compassion. Lord, I pray that as the minds begin to meet, that you remove the personal agendas, that you remove the politics, that you remove all the issues that are not important towards helping people to have health when they need it. I pray, Lord, that you help us to, to, to not come to show our intellect as much as to show our collective wisdom as we seek to build a Caribbean and a Caribbean people that will last and show the world that truly we are excellent. I pray, Lord, that the, the, the result of this meeting will not just be, be because of one or two people, but it will be the collective effort. Remind us, Lord, of the African proverb that says that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go long, if you want this to last the distance, to serve the next generations, you've got to go together. So, Lord, I pray for a spirit of unity and cooperation, a spirit of agreement, Lord God, so that as this is launched, as this, these discussions are launched today, that they will not die because of ill will, but that they will last and go the distance. I pray for all the expertise and all the persons who will share. Lord, help each person to understand that they are important in this discussion. Cause all who are in this discussion to have open ears to listen. Because Lord, real leadership begins with listening. We thank you for this time. We commit it into your hands. And pray, Lord, that in the midst of it and at the end of it, that the people of these Caribbean regions, the peoples who you love and care for, God, that we will get the benefit. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Lewis. Welcome to each and every one of you to this, our proposed national health insurance briefing. This is, in our opinion, a step towards universal health coverage for Antiguans and Barbudans, and we are happy today that we are engaging in this discussion. We encourage you to... We encourage you to set aside for a few moments what you think you know and consider the specialists who have traveled this part before and is here to share with you some of their experiences and their knowledge, even as they engage in the discussions. But before we engage, we would like to invite Dr. Rhonda Seeley Thomas, a graduate of the University of West Indies with a Bachelor's of Medicine. She graduated in 2000 with a Master's in Public Health, and she's currently a UE Doctorate in Public Health candidate. She has been the Chief Medical Officer since 2005. Nationally, Dr. Seely Thomas serves and chairs on various committees and boards. Regionally, she is also engaged in the chairperson, as a chairmanship, sorry, of Pahos Regional Validation Committee for the elimination of the mother-to-child tran transmission of HIV and congenial syphilis. She's a member of PAHO's Technical Advisory Committee on Non-Communicable Diseases. She's a member of the Caribbean Public Health Agency's Technical Advisory Committee, a 
and also that of the French Development Agency Project Steering Committee. Dr. Seeley loves cooking, and in her, in her next life, she would like to be a chef. I think that is very important. Before we go any further, we'd like to invite Dr. Seeley Thomas to formally welcome you to our session today. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Malvin Joseph, Minister of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Professor Carl Theodore, head of the UE Health Economics Unit, and other members of the UE Health Economics team at the head table, Mr. Kevin Silston, CEO of the Medical Benefits Scheme, Mrs. Joan Carroll, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, senior officials from the Ministry of Health, members of the Medical Benefits Board, Mr. Sean Sinak, Chairman of Mount St. John Medical Center Board, Dr. Albert Duncan, Medical Director, Mount St. John Medical Center, Mrs. Soraya Dupree, President of the Antigua and Barbuda Nurses Association, Dr. Lafia Stevens, and members of the Antigua and Barbuda Medical Association, uh, Dr. Vanetta George, President of the Antigua and Barbuda Medical Council, Dr. Derek Marshall, who's our Senior Dental Consultant, and also Chairman of the Antigua and Barbuda Medical Board, Mr. Ronald Hewitt, PAHO Country Program Specialist, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to welcome all of you on behalf of the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and, and, and the Environment to this proposed National Health Insurance Stakeholder Briefing. Permit me to use the few minutes allotted to me to welcome you to also define three important concepts that are pertinent to this morning's briefing. They are universal health coverage, national health insurance, and health systems. Firstly, universal health coverage essentially means that all individuals, communities, receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. It includes the full spectrum of essential health services from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. In other words, the goal of universal health coverage is to ensure a healthy population through health promotion, disease prevention, adequate disease treatment, including rehabilitation, and care for the terminally, terminally, terminally ill patients and their families in an organized manner. Secondly, national health insurance has been defined as a system of health insurance that ensures a population against the cost of health care. It is a financing mechanism that is used by countries to achieve universal health coverage. Thirdly, according to, according to the World Health Organization, or WHO, a health system is all organizations, people, and actions whose primary intent is to promote, restore, or maintain health. WHO has further defined six building blocks of a health system to include leadership and governance, healthcare financing, the health workforce, information and research, medical products and technologies, and service delivery. Note that a health system is not only the Ministry of Health. It is not only the Mount St. John Medical Center and community clinics, and a health system is not just the private sector. A health system includes all of the above working together. More specifically, the Ministry of Health in Antigua and Barbuda provides leadership and governance, and the health workforce and service delivery as a mix of the public and private sectors. The concepts of universal health coverage and a national health insurance system are not new to Antigua and Barbuda. They have been instituted to various policies over the years. The most important and well-recognized of these is the Medical Benefits Scheme, or MBS, that was instituted some 40 years ago in Antigua and Barbuda. In 1978, when the Medical Benefits Scheme was first implemented, it provided medication for nine chronic diseases, including the non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, payment for hospitalization, and overseas medical treatment. Over time, the MBS has evolved, and benefits have increased. The number of di diseases covered have increased, and there is now a focus on prevention through schools and our screening programs. 
If we pause for a moment and reflect on the definition of UHC or universal health coverage given previously, we will recognize that some of its critical components are not included in NBS and central government package. If we use diabetes as an example, the medical benefits scheme and central government provide treatment and some prevention services, but health promotion that creates an enabling environment, rehabilitation, and palliative care have not been suitably addressed. This is true if we analyze our responses to many other diseases and conditions. Antigua and Barbuda's health system over the years has been funded by the MBS, Medical Benefit Scheme, and from central government in support of primary services and secondary care not covered by MBS. Private health insurance and out-of-pocket payments also contribute. However, there are health financing gaps that affect the quality, efficiency, and effect effectiveness of our care. It, also, it is our hope that national health insurance will address these gaps, expand coverage, increase health access, and reduce out-of-pocket payments, and create a single-payer health system. In outlining the principles of universal health coverage, Dr. Carissa Etienne, director of the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, has stated that universal health coverage provides renewed focus on the social determinants of health and the engagement of other actors and civil society promote health and well-being. On that note, I welcome members of the NGOs, society organizations, the media, and all of whom have a critical role to play in the development of national health insurance in Antigua and Barbuda. Research has shown that the best path to universal health coverage is to build on institutions that are already in place. Countries that have done it that way have been more successful. For Antigua and Barbuda, the Medical Benefits Scheme provides the ideal platform for the establishment of national health insurance. It is therefore the foundation on which our national health insurance will be built. The board members, the executive staff, and others at the MBS will play a vital role in providing information and guidance as we move forward with this initiative. A warm welcome is extended to the MBS team. As we are all aware, MBS comp contributions from employees and employer contributions as we are all aware, MBS contributions come from employers and employees. As such, any discussion related to the medical benefit scheme must involve the representation from employers and employees. We welcome the employees' federation, unions, and other organizations and institutions that represent these important players. Dr. Etienne, the PAHO director, has also stated that there is no one model for national health insurance that all countries should follow. We will therefore develop a system of national health insurance that is unique to Antigua and Barbuda and suits our special needs. PAHO has recommended the technical expertise of the University of the West Indies Health Economics Unit. They have been contracted by the Ministry of Health to guide us in the process. A warm welcome is therefore extended to the UE Health Economics team who will be working with us over the next few months. We look forward to your engagement and the transfer of technology that we recognize as part of your philosophy. I wish to use this opportunity to extend sincere appreciation to the PAHO director for the technical and financial support to the Ministry of Health and the Environment in this process. Mr. Hewitt, please convey our sentiments to the director. I believe that welcome remarks at occasions such as these should be like a lady's skirt, short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover everything. I hope that my few words have indeed been very interesting. I recognize that there are a few concepts that I may not have been able to cover. However, I hope that you have, a better, you have a better appreciation of universal health coverage, national health insurance, and the definition of a health system. Since this is but a first of many engagements and consultations on these important topics, I am confident that over the next few months, your understanding and appreciation of these concepts and what we seek to achieve will improve. Again, a very warm welcome to all stakeholders and visitors. Thanks for your interest as we improve our health system by ensuring universal health coverage to the development of national health insurance in Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seeley, and I trust that everybody feels welcome. If you do, smile. No? All right. Somebody said no. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to turn to the other person, uh, whether on your right or on your left, and you're going to say welcome. That's just to seal everything Dr. Seeley just said. 
I think at this point, everybody should feel welcome. The Minister of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Honorable Malwin Joseph, invited you here specially to participate in this stakeholder briefing on the proposed national health insurance. He has been the Minister of Health since 2014, since 2014. Some of his accomplishments include passing the anti-tobacco legislation, and he received uh, uh, an award from PAHO. He has served on the PAHO Executive Committee. He's the current chair of the CARICOM Council for Human and Social Development, and he also chairs the Caribbean Health Agency Executive Board. As a minister, indeed, he has a heart for the people, and he recognizes the potential benefits of such a national health insurance, such an important system. I now invite the Honorable Minister to address you today at this very important briefing on the proposed national health insurance. Please join me in welcoming the Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Honorable Malwin Joseph. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Reverend Jason Lewis, Mrs. Joan Carrot, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Dr. Ronda Seeley Thomas, Chief Medical Officer of the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Dr. Albert Duncan, Mount St. John Medical Center Medical Director, Mr. Sean Sinek, Chairman of the Board for Mount St. John Medical Center, Mr. Ronald Hewitt, PAHO's representative, Mrs. Soraya Dupree, President of the Antigua and Barbuda Nurses Association, senior officials from the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Senator Osbert Frederick, Chairman of the Medical Benefits Board and other board members, Mr. Kevin Silston, CEO of the Medical Benefits Scheme, Professor Carl Theodore, and the team from the University of the West Indies Health Economic Unit, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning and welcome. Health has been defined as the complete physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. In this context, the health of the people of Antigua and Barbuda is of the most the utmost priority for the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, and by extension, the government of Antigua and Barbuda. Let me state emphatically as well that by extension, the Prime Minister, the Honorable Gaston Brown, who fully understands that transforming this country into an economic powerhouse is dependent on this country's citizens, residents, physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. This concept of a healthy nation was emphasized by CARICOM heads of government in the NASA Declaration on Health in the Bahamas in 2001, which states, Open quote, the health of the nation is the wealth of the nation, close quote. Allow me, therefore, to give a brief overview of our country's health status. Our health indicators illustrate that we have done well as a nation. We can boast low maternal mortality rates. We continue to achieve international targets and indicators such as those for the elimination 
of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and congenital syphilis. We have been part of the regional initiative that has seen the elimination of measles and polio from the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, however, these gains are fragile and we have to be vigilant and mitigate any threats that can easily reverse them. For example, in the case of measles elimination, it took one tourist with this disease who traveled from the United Kingdom to Antigua and Barbuda early last year, threatened the entire population. However, our high vaccination coverage for measles in the population, along with the swift intervention from the Ministry of Health staff, led to no onward transmission of the disease in the community. With globalization, the threat of reintroduction of measles and other vaccine-preventable diseases into Antigua and Barbuda remains. Our high immunization coverage must be sustained through reliable procurement mechanisms. Therefore, vaccination and other public health programs must remain a priority for the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment. In the area of non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and cancer are on the rise. The main cancers seen are breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. Complications of diabetes and hypertension such as diabetic retinopathy, chronic renal failure, and amputations continue to increase. We are plagued with emerging and re-emerging diseases including mosquito-borne disease such as dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Our response has been the provision of medication through medical benefit scheme for 11 diseases. We provide dialysis, renal transplant for those with chronic renal failure. We provide chemotherapy and radiotherapy for those with cancer. We have been able to provide ophthalmology services through the donations of healthcare personnel, equipment, and supplies. When services such as cardiology neurosurgery, and other medical specialties are not available in Antigua and Barbuda, we either get the cardiologist or neurosurgeon or other medical specialist here to provide the service or transport the patient many times by air ambulance along with their loved ones to where the medical services are available. Primary health care health promotion, and disease prevention are also priorities. Let me remind you that the government has also had to respond to medical catastrophes that have occurred in our Twin Island state when critical medical services were needed. We grieved as a nation on New Year's Day in 2016 when a 16-year-old female suffered 55% second and third degree burns to her body. My government, this government, guaranteed the payment in excess of several million EC dollars for her treatment in Martinique and subsequently France. The same was done when one of our healthcare providers from the Mount St. John Medical Center and a child also suffered severe burns. Despite the odds of survival, the government of Antigua and Barbuda still provided the assistance because we see each human life as, a precious, as precious and will do all that we can to preserve such a life. These efforts to ensure health of the people of Antigua and Barbuda remains a priority for this government. 
As technology improves, as medicines become more effective, and as the catastrophes and disasters increase, we recognize that resources will be needed to provide a full range of healthcare services, including prevention and treatment of both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Records indicate that the government expenditure and that of the Medical Benefit Scheme for Healthcare has steadily increased over the years. Between 2012 and 2019, the Ministry of Health's budget allocation increased from 95 million to EC 109 million. The Medical Benefit Scheme's expenditure on pharmaceuticals alone increased by 45% over the 10-year period between 2009 and 2019. As I speak, for pharmaceuticals alone, distributed by medical benefits, it is costing the medical benefits approximately $15 million annually. If you combine that with the burden on medical benefits to cover pharmaceuticals and drugs for the entire nation, it amounts to approximately $30 million. Bear in mind that 2019 is not yet completed, and this is expected to increase. The Medical Benefit Scheme payments for procurement, central medical supplies, government clinics, and the Mount St. John Medical Center increased from $3 million in 2014 to $10.4 million in 2019, and still counting. For overseas medical treatment, the amount spent by MBS in 2009 to 2019 ranges from 1.1 million in 2009 to 5.7 million so far in 2019, and we are still counting. This is an increase of over 400%. Dialysis costs over the 10 years have also increased substantially. In addition to ensuring sufficient financial resources, we acknowledge that we have to become self-sufficient as a nation and not rely wholly on donations and on itinerant physicians for medical care. We have achieved this partially in ophthalmology, where patients are no longer required to travel overseas for some ophthalmology services. The intent being that soon the more common ophthalmology services will be available here in Antigua and Barbuda. We now have urologists and neurologists employed full-time at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, the first time starting in this very year. We envisage that in not too distant future, more cardiology and neurological services will also be readily available here in Antigua and Barbuda. A vital component of university and universal health coverage is financial access and the quality of services provided. The aim is that no Antiguan and Barbudan should suffer financial hardship in order to receive the quality health care that they need. I would wish to repeat it. The aim is that no Antiguan and Barbudan should suffer financial hardship in order to receive the quality health care that they need. We see health care as a fundamental human right. Too many times, patients do not have the resources to receive treatment needed to save their lives. Too many times, patients here in Antigua and Barbuda have the added stress of worrying where the money would come from, from for their diagnostic tests. How many of you know of students who have had to stop their studies because of a catastrophic illness in the family? 
How many of you know of mothers or fathers who have voluntarily surrendered to their illness in order for the rest of the family to have a chance to carry on? I have seen this so many times since becoming the Minister of Health. I have seen and heard from the scores of our citizens and residents who have suffered financial hardship as a result of unaffordable health care costs. They visit my office regularly to seek solace, seeking comfort, seeking a listening ear, seeking reassurance, but most of all, seeking relief from the financial burden they bear because of medical diagnosis. The government of Antigua and Barbuda says, no more, no more. I say to financial hardship for people because of escalating health care costs. No more to persons dying because they lack the financial resources to access services not available in Antigua and Barbuda. No more to persons not being able to access what are considered basic health care services in more developed countries. No more inability to quickly respond to catastrophic medical events. Our ambition is universal health coverage in Antigua and Barbuda, where all individuals and communities receive the health care service they need without suffering the financial hardship. Our ambition is that all Antiguans and Barbudans receive the full spectrum of essential health care services from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. Our ambition is that all Antiguans and Barbudans have access to the services that address the most significant cause of disease and death in our population. Our ambition is not only to ensure a minimum package of health services, but it is also about ensuring progressive expansion of coverage of health, health services that meet the needs of the people. Our ambition is not only to ensure individual treatment services, but also to include population-based services such as public health campaigns and creating supportive environment for healthy lifestyles to prevent and control non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and mental health conditions. Our ambition is to combat the common risk factors of tobacco use, unhealthy diets that contain sugars and trans fats, physical inactivity, and the harmful use of alcohol, as well as the emerging issue of childhood obesity. Our ambition is to address more than just health services, but to take the firm steps towards equity, social inclusion, and cohesion, and social justice. Lloyd Blankfein, an American businessman from the 1950s described ambition as your inner voice that tells you that you should strive to go beyond your circumstances and or station in life. My inner voice tells me that universal health coverage is the way for us to go beyond the circumstances of spiraling health care costs, NCDs, and re-emerging diseases and ensure a healthy nation. This is just not my voice. In 2014, Antigua and Barbuda joined other countries in the Americas in endorsing PAHO's strategy for universal access to health and universal health coverage. In 2015, at the United Nations, as part of the commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Antigua and Barbuda committed to Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Goal three, to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages includes targets 3.8 on universal health coverage. More recently, in September of this year, Antigua and Barbuda participated 
in an endorsed United Nations Declaration on Universal Health Coverage. Ladies and gentlemen, national health insurance is one mechanism whereby we can fulfill these commitments and achieve universal health coverage for our people. How will we move forward to implement national health insurance, you may ask. We intend to do so to three basic steps. Firstly, with unwavering political will. Secondly, with the appropriate technical exp expertise. And thirdly, through interactive collaboration with relevant stakeholders like you present here this morning. In terms of political will, the cabinet of Antigua and Barbuda has embraced and approved the establishment of the national health insurance as a means of achieving universal health coverage in Antigua and Barbuda. This is a firm government policy. In terms of technical exp expertise, we are delighted and honored that we have with us technical experts will be from the University of the West Indies Health Economic Unit that has vast experience in this area. They have ably assisted other countries in the region in establishing national health insurance. Not only does this team have the expertise and knowledge, but they have an appreciation of the culture and nuances of Caribbean people. This is why they came to us highly recommended by other regional governments and the Pan American Health Organization. Last but, but no means least, the third step through meaningful engagement and with our stakeholder partners. I am pleased that so many of you are present here this morning. I see this as an indication of your recognition of the importance of this National Health Insurance Initiative for Antigua and Barbuda. Please be assured that this morning is not a one-off engagement. It is a start of a relationship. Be assured that we will be calling on you to participate fully, and if I might say, to agree or disagree, to give your views, to provide data and information. I urge all of you to be part of this initiative that will change or transform the healthcare landscape in Antigua and Barbuda. I approach this journey with great confidence because I recall that when the education levy was introduced in Antigua and Barbuda in 2004, there were many who did not have the confidence that it would work to be an outstanding way of financing education in Antigua and Barbuda. The records will show there's hardly anyone in Antigua and Barbuda now would wish to see the end of the education levy. In 25 years, this measure has raised approximately $550 million in education. $137 million of that 550 was spent in scholarships. And there were over 3,750 young minds in Antigua and Barbuda who had the opportunity to get scholarship to travel abroad. There are some of them who are back now as doctors, and they are working at the Mount St. John Medical Center as specialists. This morning, I wish to just confirm what the chief medical officer said, that we will be consulting, we will be collaborating. And one of the measures that we will take is to establish as part of the process, a steering committee which will include not only public sector individuals who work in the government, but would also include 
every organization, including unions, whether they're teachers or nurses, to be part of this steering committee. We want to establish a wide range of different individuals who we feel can make contribution to contribute to the success of this important venture. I take this opportunity once again to introduce the team from the University of the West Indies, headed by Professor Theodore, and we will listen to them as they outline their program and what they intend to deliver to the people, to the government that will work for all citizens and residents in the nation of Antigua and Barbuda. With humility, I say thank you and may God bless you. Thank you, sir, for your address and for the updates within the health sector. I'd also like to say thank you to the Medical Benefits Scheme, the Medical Benefits Board and its, and its members for the hard work and dedication and commitment. They have indeed been a pillar of strength throughout this whole process. As was expressed earlier, we have a five-member team currently in Antigua visiting from the HEU Center for Health Economics and the University of the West Indies, uh, led by Professor Carl Theodore. We also have along with him, Dr. Stanley Lauter. We have Dr. Anton Cumberbatch. We have Ms. Charmaine Mativa and Mrs. Patricia Edwards Westcott. Could you give them a round of applause and a warm welcome? from the island where land and sea makes beauty. Antigua, that is. <laughs> At this time, we're going to invite Professor Carl Theodore. He is Professor Emeritus of the Health Economic Unit, Center for Health Economics at the University Center of the West Indies. He has extensive experience in the areas of economics, public policy, health sector reform, and development. As a professor of economics at the Department of Economics on the St. Augustine campus, he taught public sector economics and fiscal policy and development as well as health economics. He has also supervised research in these areas for many years. His early work focused on fiscal policy including tax reform issues, the social sector including health and social security and public policy in general. As such, he has functioned in an advisory capacity to many of the regional and international agencies that operates in the Caribbean and where interest is in the social sectors. Professor Theodore, over the years, has worked closely with the trade union movement, the credit union movement, and the social security organizations. His professional work has been mainly directed at protecting the economic position of the ordinary people of our society. He is strong in the belief that the management of our economic affairs has been and continues to be a source of unnecessary hardship to many people. For this reason, he has in the past found it necessary to speak out publicly when economic policies which he thought were harmful were being proposed or adapted. In shifting his focus to help Professor Theodore to help, sorry, Professor Theodore has concentrated on the efficiency of health systems and on the way these systems touch the lives of the ordinary people in these countries. In this respect, much of his work has focused on health financing systems. He has led a multidisciplinary team of professionals in producing a number of technical reports for governments and international agencies and has also produced significant pieces of work on the operations of the health systems in different countries in the Caribbean region. The HEU Center for Health Economics, formerly the Health Economics Unit, was founded in 1995 and continues to do extensive health, sorry, extensive work on health systems, strengthening country support and related activities in health, 
policy design, and social security in the region. Professor Theodore works with a team of professionals with extensive experience in national health insurance and social security and has co-authored research on physical space for the health sector as well as on economic impact of HIV AIDS and non-communicable diseases. Please put your hands together as we welcome Professor Carl Theodore Emerton. Good morning. When I hear an introduction like that, I wonder something, who are they talking about? Um, uh, Reverend Lewis, uh, Minister Joseph, Dr. Seely, uh, Mr. Silston from the MBS, Ms. Joan Carrot, Pearson Health, Mr. Hewitt, Pahu Rep. Uh, members of the medical and nursing fraternity, including senior personnel from Mount St. John, and officers of the Ministry of Health and the MBS. Morning to you all. I'm never good at these lists, but I hope I did not make a mess of it. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Ministry of Health for inviting us to be part of this exercise, the exercise which involves uh, making the transition of the MBS to a national health insurance system. I, I want to begin by saying that the university, we are here as consultants on the project, but the university is not a consulting firm. The HU, we are not a consulting firm. As university, our mission really, and the ATU in particular, our mission has been to work with the countries of the region to do the things that would make life better for the people in the region. That is what we really want to do. And as we come here to help to put the national health insurance uh, together, that I think is what I want you all to in us. Because, for example, we are here, we obviously have, uh, we, we, there, there's a contract and we are going to be in Antigua for eight, eight months. But of course, our commitment though is to stay with Antigua until this NHI is set up properly, until it starts running properly. So that even, after, even after the contract is finished, as we tell all, all the countries, the, the contract may be finished, but the HU, the university, is there willing and ready to help to make sure that you get it done right. That is what we, 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 we are here for. As Dr. Seely and Minister have already told you, the context really of the National Health Insurance is the government's commitment to universal health coverage. And the, the two main aspects of universal health coverage that I want everybody to remember and was stated very well by both Dr. Seeley and the minister. The first aspect of universal health coverage is that we're looking, you're looking to get a system where every single person in the country, every resident, every citizen has access to good health care. And this access to care must not involve financial distress. You see, we have lived in a region where, if we are frank with ourselves, we know that the guarantee for good health care in this region is if you have money. That, that is the guarantee. I'm not saying that there are people who didn't get good health care when they didn't have money. That, people, that, that did happen. But the guarantee of good health care has always been having money. And as Minister has said very emphatically, that is what the government wants to change. That, in, in, in that sense, you want to change the way the country works and the way the country feels about itself. 
You want people to know they're living in a country where getting sick does not mean that you might be under financial distress. Now, it means then that, but if we want to do that, we have to take the, the steps to go there. And one of the main steps, as the minister mentioned, is this national health insurance. Because the, the national health insurance, and my two colleagues coming later, Dr. Kamarach and Dr. Lal, they will explain it in more detail. But roughly, the, the, briefly, the national health insurance is what we call a social insurance system, whereby we are going to be requiring everybody to put funds into a pool uh, so that everybody would have access to care. And just before I go on, I want to just tell you one thing about these systems, these social insurance systems. All the work we have done and all the research we have seen has told us, has shown us that when you put a social insurance system in place, the cost of that system to the country is less than what the country is paying now for its health care. Listen to me very carefully. We, 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 we're thinking of putting a system where every single person has access to good care. And I'm telling you, the cost of it to the country is going to be less than what the country is paying now for care. The cost the country is paying now is jointly paid by the uh, government and people pay out of their pockets. When you add up those two, you get what they call the national cost of care. Well, the NHI is going to come in at a figure lower than what that cost is going to be. It is going to happen. Now, but of course, with this universal health coverage, as Melissa explained very clearly, that it is, it's a range of services. And this is where the development on the MBS will come. The MBS has been delivering some services, but the NHI is going to be delivering a wider range of services and a wider population catchment. It's obvious then that more resources are going to be required to do this. It means then that if you come in with this system, you, you, we have to make sure then that the way we use our resources would be important because the, the sustainability of the system will depend on how we use those resources. Now, it means then that the, one of the things that we're going to have to be prepared for in Antigua Barbuda is that the way we do things in the health system will have to change in some ways. We know the MBS has focused on quality of services and on access to services. And these are two critical factors in any health system, the access to services and the quality of those services. And the, and the MBS has been very good on this front. But you see now where we're going into a wider use of resources, to more services for more people, there is there something else that has to come in very importantly. And that is the efficiency of the use of these, of these resources. Because if we don't use the resources efficiently, then that access we're talking about and that quality of services we're talking about will not last. It's not going to happen. The, the use of resources now becomes the central thing. And this is what the NHI is going to make sure happens. There, you know, there are three pillars 
of the efficiency that the HU is going to try to help establish you know, the three pillars. The first pillar, what we're going to do, we're going to develop a costing framework for the health system in the sense that we, we know that the health services, there has been some costing of services, but we are going to be looking and make sure that every single service that will have to be paid for by the NHI, we will be sure, we have to find out for sure what the cost of the service is. But it's, but it's, it's, it's not simply finding out that cost number. That because the, the framework we're talking about will give us not just the numbers, the framework will also tell us how the costs are being generated. And that is what we will need to know if, if we have to manage the thing well, how the costs are being generated. Because when we see costs being generated at levels that we, that we, that we are not um, happy with, then we'll know that we have to intervene and do, and do something. So, so the costing framework then is the first pillar, and it gives it will give the management of the NHI the capacity to monitor because what we, we are going to be monitoring and making the changes as necessary in a timely fashion. So that's the first pillar of the efficiency thing. The second pillar of it is the health information system that has to come with the NHI. The NHI cannot be run without a health information system. And what the health information system will do, it will change the way things are done in the health system in that we essentially will be getting rid of paper and everything will be digitized. We will, the health information system will allow us to monitor every contact between patients and provide every single contact. We'll monitor it, we'll track, you know, what people came for, what resources were applied in the care, and we'd also be able to track what the outcomes were, what happened to people after the care. That's what the health information system. And with that information system, the level of accountability then in the health system would rise to a level we never had it before, enable us, uh, uh, giving us the capacity again to make sure that the cost of what we're doing is going to be controlled. The third pillar of efficiency that we're going to be working on is the legislation on standards and on protocols. Because you can't be delivering, if in the delivery system, you can't have a delivery system where people, it's just up to the individuals, up to their own training, personal training and personal experiences to, to say what, how the things are done. If we have to be able to predict and to control our costs, we have to have a system where when certain problems arise, people that are helping us to solve the problems know what we expect them to do. And it will have to be legislated. Now, all of us, all of us, if, if it has ever happened, or if we are friends who have had the experience, are very comfortable when we know somebody gets, goes for care in, in the USA, or in Canada, or in the UK, or in Europe, we, we, we are comfortable, they, they go for care there. But you know the reason why we're comfortable is because we know there are standards that those systems operate by. In this region, we have never operated with a set of legislated standards, but with the NHI, that's going to be essential. Because the NHI, is not going to pay for care that is not of the quality that is expected. The information we'll keep getting on what is happening will tell us if the care that is being delivered 
is of the quality that is expected, and the payments will then be adjusted accordingly. The NHI will only pay for care that is of the quality that is expected. So these are the three pillars of efficiency that our work is going to be on. And it, it means then that in, in, in transitioning from the MBS to the National Health Insurance, this dimension of efficiency is going to be critical. Having said that, though, I must be frank with you and tell you that as important as the efficiency I'm talking about is to the system, the sustainability of the system, it is not going to be sufficient. And um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kamabas, who will have a few words with you, will explain that in more detail. But you see, because it, as we know, to accomplish things, to make things happen, you have conditions that some are necessary and some are sufficient. Efficiency is a necessary condition. We, 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 we have to have it. We have to have it if the system is going to be sustainable and continue delivering for us in the way that we want to deliver. But it will, we will need something else. And as uh, Dr. Carlos will explain, I imagine, he, it says the, we, our own behaviors will have to change. As I said just now, in, in, in mentioning the legislation of, of, of our standards and protocols, the presumption there is that the behavior of providers will then have to change. But the behavior of the population also will have to, have to change. So we're gonna, you're gonna hear a bit more about that just now. So in, in, in fact, what, what we are going to do, in summary then, we are going to be expanding and building on what the MBS has been doing. And in fact, as the minister said, what we are going to be helping you to put in place is a system which, which will guarantee good health care for every single person. It is, it is the guarantee that is, is going to be important. Um, and it means then that we're going to be able to say that Antigua has become, will have become a country where the access to good health care does not depend on the money that we have. Now, of course, when you talk it like this, people ask the question, well, maybe some good, but could we really afford that? But I want to tell you that, you know, I mean, in case you didn't do it, Antigua is not a poor country, you know. It's not a poor country. It's not a poor country at all. In, in, in the region, in fact, Antigua has one of the highest per capita uh, uh, GDP, high, high. And the World Bank, in fact, has labeled Angela as a, 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 Antigua as a high-income country. Antigua is a high-income country. Now, I want you to think, if you live in a high-income country, it means that you have the capacity to provide good health care for everybody. What we have to decide on ourselves is whether we're willing to make the changes necessary to, to, to make it happen. And what we are here to do is to work with you to make sure that those changes are made successfully. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Theodore. A necessary culture change. Three pillars, cost and framework, an effective health insurance system, and then legislation, standards, and protocols. All those are important. I'm going to make a slight insertion on your program, and at this point I'm going to invite Dr. Anton Cumberbatch, another member of the team, to come and continue from where Dr. Sorry, Professor Theodore left off. He's the former CMO of 
uh, Trinidad and Tobago. He was the chief medical officer for the period 2008 to 2013. He's a member of the Health Economic Unit since its inception in 1995, and he provides technical advice. He's a public health specialist, and he has been working in the field of financing since 1975. Put your hands together and welcome Dr. Anton Cumberbatch, please. Good morning, thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Good morning, everyone. The Honorable Malwin Joseph, Minister of Health, members of the head table, Ministry of Health senior officials, Dr. Celie Thomas, and may I just say that she is my colleague from way before as a former CMO, and she's my personal friend, eminently qualified. I must put that in, Dr. C. Members of the NBS, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of all, all the health organizations present. Um, Professor Theodore, um, whom I work with, asked me to just say a few words with respect to the national health insurance and to put it in perspective, because I think it's important that we do that. The first thing that I would want to say is that even though we are talking about a health financing system, which is national health insurance, the objective of the exercise really lies in the foundation that the government has enunciated in terms of universal health coverage. That is the mission, this is the goal that we are going towards. Um, you must commend the country for taking that step. The other mission that is happening within that context is that in order to do something like that, you have to modernize your health system. So this national health insurance is the modernization of the health financing aspect of business, joining the countries that we like to emulate and say those are first world countries. So when you talk about the countries in Europe and Southeast Asia, a fundamental plank of the modernization process is a national insurance and coverage for the population. The other point that Professor made, Professor Theodore made, that you must understand, a modern healthcare system must have modern health information system. This is the key to modernization. It has given us an opportunity in the Caribbean and other smaller places and places that do not identify themselves as first world countries. Health information systems and the modernization of health information systems using modern health technology has given us the opportunity to make the jump whereby you can now track information and send it online. So we don't have to walk through the time period that other countries did. We can make the jump. Just as how we made the jump to cell phones. So what I want to, I know when we start saying these things, people get difficulty in conceiving it in their heads. And I just want to put something on the table to show you that how this jump will be made with the time. If you can remember 20 years ago, going to the bank, you never had these cards. You had to go and write with a paper. Now everybody has a card. And right now the bank is telling you, call me over your cell phone, send me a WhatsApp, don't come into my bank. And everybody has accepted that. It's the same situation. Modern health information systems allows us to transmit information real time, not only on patient data, but on investigations and also interventions. So you can be doing surgery in one country and somebody's looking at a video in another country advising you of what to do. 
And that is very possible with Antigua. Once you have that interconnectivity, that those things are possible. And that is the way to modernize your health information system. The important point to understand that we are talking about here is even though national health insurance is about health financing, the purpose of the exercise is to improve the health status of the citizens as individuals and the country. That is the purpose of the exercise. The purpose of the exercise is not to collect money for collecting money sick. Let me repeat that. The purpose of the exercise is to improve the health status of the citizens of the country. The other statement is also true. Money cannot do that. Let me say it so that everybody understands clearly. Improving people's health status starts with a responsibility of individuals. If you live healthy lives, you will have less morbidity and pain to deal with. Let me repeat it. Now, I can give you examples of people who had the greatest amounts of money and they still died. The point here is this. There's a responsibility on behalf of the population to ensure that you live healthy as possible so that the morbidity, the, the episodes of illness that you would have, that you would then need to go to the health system for improvement, are reduced. That is fundamental, especially in the Caribbean. Why is that? Because of the epidemiology of the diseases we have. The minister made it quite clear about what is going on. You have made great strides in maternal and child health care, and we want to keep that. We have made great strides in immunizations in some areas, and we want to keep that. But the chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, cancers, and I will now add mental health. If you listen to what the minister said, the morbidity figures, the numbers are vast. Now, no con or the entire world is facing this problem. And an example of what is the issue is this. The people lying in the hospital beds, they do not represent the total numbers with the problem. You know. They are those with the extreme complications. The majority of us, and thousands of us walking about the place with high blood pressure, with diabetes, with all kinds of illnesses, we are working, including mental health, we are working and not performing at our maximum best. And when we cannot compensate anymore, that is when we end up in the hospital. The solution to that is prevention. Fortunately for us, we in the Caribbean, we live in a place that allows us to exercise every day. We don't have winter. Let me say it again. We don't have winter. Fortunately for us, we live in a place where we can grow our own food. The biggest problem that we are facing in children and young adults is obesity, including in Antigua. Obesity is what gives you diabetes and high blood pressure. We are seeing and I'm sure it's happening in Antigua, I could tell you in Trinidad, we are seeing diabetes in our school children and high blood pressure. People at age 30 are having, having heart attacks. That is self-induced harm because of the way we live. So as we are modernizing the approach to our healthcare system, we must make sure that we live healthy lives so that we do not create a burden on the health system which we have to finance. The other point I'm going to say is, people find this a controversial point, but I say it because there's facts. We are importing food that is killing us. 
Let me say it again. Packaged processed food that you eat all the time is the harbinger of death. Grow your own food and eat your own food. I said that, the CMO, former CMO of Trinidad and Tobago. That is the key. Packaged foods with all the preservatives, all the hormones, all the antibiotics is the problem. You need to exercise. You drink alcohol in moderation, and we need to be careful with that because that excess alcohol, especially drinking among our young people, because our young people are drinking. No smoking of cigarettes, and you live healthy life. We need to be careful that we are importing lifestyles and then saying, let us use the medical systems of abroad to save us. We cannot do that because we will not be able to replace hearts, kidneys, joints, and all those things. They may have the money, but I will tell you, it's only the rich ones in those foreign countries that get these things. We can avoid all of these things. You don't have to have diabetes. You don't have to have high blood pressure. It's the journey, and we have children, so the journey we are on, because what we're doing here with the health insurance is a journey. You're starting to transform your health system, but the inputs into the health system also have to be transformed. That is how you control the costs, the inputs. The in, we are the inputs. The other major opportunity you are getting here is the development of your local health systems. If you, as you're making an investment into the health insurance and you're putting more resources into it, you have to make your health services both public and private, of greater quality so that people do not run abroad for simple things. The reason you do that is because you do not have the confidence in what is happening here. And the way you get that confidence is standards of care. Standards of care. Standards of care are not things ushered from doctors' mouths. They are written and legislated. And the responsible organization for that is the Ministry of Health. That's the only organization who understands what healthcare in terms of mission, goals, and standards. There are no other. So the Ministry of Health has a responsibility for establishing standards of care, protocols, and reviewing those standards. Standards have two aspects to it, objective and subjective. How do we get the information from standards of care? Professor Ted was making the point. When you go for services and it's paid for the health insurance, the providers will send in the claims. It is on those claims, and those claims are not identified by names, but they, all the national insurances, you would have a card and a number. It would, by coding, says, what was the diagnosis? What was the treatment? And we will then be able to know X, Y, Z, what was done. However, in modern countries with national health insurances, one of the responsibility of the health insurance is to also check with patients afterwards to make an assessment of what type of care they got from the provider. So there's an audit function for the public. They would they do these surveys so that we would know whether the service was done, what was the outcome, but you would also find out on these surveys that are done on the population what they thought of the care they got in the hospital. Now, when I'm talking about care services, we are talking the public hospitals, the public clinics, the private doctors, everybody. The standards of care refer to everybody. So the Ministry of Health role in all of this has to be what we call a regulator and standard setting. So the ministry may need to devolve itself of some function if it is saying, I am running a hospital. We would want to have a difference in that arrangement. So to summarize, 
population because healthcare systems, now remember you're on a journey. This is not tomorrow morning we expect this. You are preparing for the future. And the reason why you need to prepare for the future is this. The cost of care is going to go up because the type of technologies and what can be offered in the future is going to be very expensive. So we cannot see we will allow ourselves to become sick to try to buy that because you're going to be getting designer drugs for individuals for cancer. If you have an idea of what that means, it means that if you have cancer, they will design a drug just for you. And if you think of that, the cost of that for you will be prohibitive. So what, is, what are the objectives? You have to make sure you don't get cancer. It's as simple as that. And you don't have to. So the population has a major role to play, starting from now as you modernize the healthcare system. The financing system you are modernizing and the reporting through the health information systems. And then you know what you would hear, people would say, the professionals, we are not accustomed doing that. In every country that is developed, that has modern healthcare systems, every single one, all doctors report. Let me say it. Every single one, they have to report. If they don't report, they don't get paid. That's how it is. That is what makes those standards work. So you have that as a part of the arrangement. The payment is also guaranteed. The other big thing that you're about to do that is going to transform the place is that as you ensure everybody, the question of this country now becoming a country that pays for health care by insurance will be established. We call that the insurance mandate. So the private sector will be guaranteed their space from now on because everything will be part of insurance. What part of it in terms of how they expand and how they contract will be up to them. But what you are just doing is converting an industry in an environment from 15% to 100%. So let no one see that the insurance, private insurance will be stifled at all. It doesn't happen. It's up to them to decide what aspects of business they want to forever and ever because people in Antigua will now have insurance. So I just wanted to say these few words to let you know that the health insurance, the way the health economics unit, we function, is that when we're designing the health insurance together with the clients, we also design the fit of the health insurance into the health system to modernize the approach, but also let you know what are the cost controls that you have to have, including the input. So if you continue to have high morbidity, the cost of care to the country will continue to climb. So with those few words, thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to the work with you. Thank you, Dr. Kumpabach. He encourages us to live healthy lives. The input is important. He also encourages us to eat homegrown. I think that is something that we have been hearing a lot about. He said the purpose of the national health insurance is to improve the health status of individuals. And uh, by virtue of that, we will be a better nation, a more healthier nation. So I encourage us to ponder on that. For our final speaker, we have Dr. Stanley Lalta, a national of Trinidad and Tobago. He's an economist for over 25, with over 25 years of experience. He has taught, he, is, he has trained, he has consulted, and he's also involved in policy research in health and development matters in almost all countries of the English and Dutch-speaking Caribbean. 
He is currently a research fellow at the HEU Center for Health Economics in Trinidad and Tobago. He's a graduate of the University of the West Indies, University of Cambridge, University of York, and University of London. His special interests and publications are in universal health coverage, health financing, social insurance, chronic diseases, and pharmacoeconomics. He's a co-editor of the book, Caribbean Economic Development, The First Independence Generation. With the stimulus and support of the Caribbean Social Security Organization, Dr. Stanley Lauter has been the program coordinator for 13 years of the Caribbean Conferences on National Health Financing, 2006 to 2019. He was a member of the Caribbean Commission on Health and Development established by PAHO and CARICOM in 2005 to chart the roadmap for health policy programs in the Caribbean. Please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Stanley Lauter. Very conveniently, I'm standing at a podium on a microphone that's very appropriate for people like me who are close to the ground. That may not be such a good thing. I could be here all morning. I'm very aware of the time, so protocol haven't been established. Um, I want to uh, share a few thoughts on how we intend to proceed with our work. But I also want to commence by congratulating the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda for becoming the center for the fifth campus of the University of the West Indies, I understand. <laughs> we will be joining our colleagues from that, the fifth center in some of the collaborative work that we are planning to undertake while we are here. Um, there's a very brief uh, presentation which we have, I think it's going to come on screen, which is more a shorthand way of trying to tell you all the things that we want to do and the likely outcomes that we're looking for in this. Um, Minister having uh, spoken and has given us a very clear indication as to where the political will is guiding us. One of the crucial aspects of our work is that one can have a lot of technical studies, a lot of research, but if it sits down on a shelf without ever seeing the light of the day, then we know that nothing is going to happen on the ground. Uh, the entire exercise that we engaged in, in terms of assisting, ours is not to replace people, ours is just to assist the team on the ground in terms of how we undertake the necessary research and design activities for putting in place a system of national health insurance. And let me straight at the top indicate that one does not have to call it national health insurance. One can use a different name. In some countries, for example, like Australia, it's called Medicare. I think Canada also called the program a Medicare program. In Singapore, for example, they called the program a MediSave program. My three slides uh, generally give you an indication as to what we are intending to do. Universal coverage, I found a shorthand way, a shorthand way of trying to tell you what universal health coverage is and it is presented in the form of a cube with three dimensions. On one dimension, we are looking at who is covered. If you have some persons who are covered and some who are not, then you have a gap in the number of persons within the population who have the right access to care. The second dimension of that slide really is pertaining into what services are covered. And what services are covered literally mean that you have to look at the burden of disease, the causes of morbidity and mortality in your country, and try to cover the essential services pertaining to these. We have been hearing that you can't cover everything, but what is most essential, what is most relevant for the country? 
And the third dimension of my cube, and we can visualize this cube or this box, is really pertaining to the financing arrangement. Many persons may be part of a plan, they may have an entitlement to services, but if they cannot pay the cost, or if the financing arrangement is going to be weak, then you are going to have a difficulty with getting the right access. This is what I mean by my shorthand way of summarizing what the minister has described, what PAHO, what WHO, what the World Bank, what all the United Nations agencies have been telling us about universal health coverage. A program where you have progressive action, so all residents can have access, barrier-free, non-discrimination, no discrimination on the basis of one's age, one's gender, one's location, one's insurance status, one's health status, no barriers to getting access to a defined package of services. It's not a loose and open-ended package, it's a defined package. Delivered efficiently, quality standards, adequately financed. A major part of the work that we'll be doing is pertaining to that side. And adequately financed, not only meaning in terms of the volume of resources, but how it is shared based on the principle of what we call equity and ability to pay. So those who have deeper pockets will be expected to contribute more than those who have very shallow pockets. And I can tell you that my pocket is somewhere in between. So when the MBS is looking at contributions, don't expect the highest amount from me nor the lowest. And so the whole matter of avoiding the burden on the poor. I've worked in countries in the Caribbean and in the Dutch speaking and English speaking Caribbean, where sometimes you get a prescription and you go to the pharmacy and you ask, well, what is the cost of these items? In Jamaica, one individual came to me and said, I went to the pharmacy. They gave me the cost of the prescription items. There were two items. One was 30 tablets, the next one was 60 tablets. And when I was told the cost, I asked for one. And the pharmacist wanted to know one of what? One of the uh, prescribed items? I said, no, I want one tablet. One tablet. That's all I could have afforded. Persons who have been prescribed also to do diagnostic tests, do surgery, and so because they don't have the resources, have to postpone it. Have to delay seeking care or have to seek other resources. They have to sell their property, uh, borrow. They have to depend on the church, for example, for special collections to support their, their means. So you want to avoid as much, as much as possible what we call this total burden of financial burden on individuals. But it's not just a matter of the curative side or the personal care, it's also the community care. And this is where the whole matter of all of government, education, finance, agriculture, trade policies, uh, nutrition policies, all of these become linked together if we want to get the kind of action we need on the social determinants, what's uh, happening to us with respect to chronic diseases, infectious diseases, violence and accidents, mental health, which Dr. Cumberbatch uh, defined. My second slide is really, as I said, my fam the famous cube, looking at three dimensions. How much of the cube are you filling? If you only fill a small portion of the cube, then it means that there are gaps. Who is covered? Does everyone have barrier-free access? Maybe not. Then who is not covered becomes part of the charge. What package of services are you covering? And it's not just having a package of services, it's guaranteeing availability and timeliness. You can't say you have X or Y in the package and it's not available. You can't say these medications are on a list and when people show up, there's a shortage. You can't say the surgical operation has been uh, offered in the package, but when you show up, well, the specialist is not coming from abroad for the next three months. Availability, guarantee, timeliness becomes very crucial in this. And the third dimension is what we really call the whole financing arrangement. 
If you can only cover part of what you generally need and you have gaps in paying for the rest, then you have a major gap. The whole purpose of what we want to do in making the transition from the MBS to an NHI, a full coverage NHI, is to fill the gaps. Who is not covered by MBS? How do we bring them on board? What services are not covered? Can we get that on board? How do we pay for all of these and the gaps in coverage? How do we bring that into the picture? That's the cube we're trying to fill, and that's my shorthand of the scope of work that we'll be engaged in in providing the technical evidence. Um, sometimes we like to compare ourselves with uh, who is ahead of us, who is behind us. In the Caribbean, it is only Bermuda, which actually has a health insurance arrangement for the population that is ahead of Antigua. Antigua uh, Bermuda's plan was set up in 1970. Antigua's plan was set up in 1978. Antigua then is second in line. There's no harm in being second. No harm at all. But you have set the pace for everyone else in the OECS countries. Because you can take a very quick look and see where the others are in the OECS. The Virgin Islands only started their plan in 2016, so they're just about four years old. And every other country, Dominica, Anguilla, St. Lucia, St. Kitts Nevis, Grenada, St. Vincent, Monstrat, are joining the line, but they have not yet implemented. Antigua then is a forerunner. You have set the pace. They're looking to you for your experience, for your knowledge. The particular project that we are working on uh, for uh, the Ministry of Health and the MBS has this particular objective. We're not here to try to solve all the problems of the health system, nor to suddenly remove all chronic diseases or infectious diseases from the population. We can't do that. Our scope of work is a bit more limited. It is a step towards all of those, but it is a vital step. We had to try to develop the documentation, the uh, sharing of information, the capacity building with the MBS and other organizations to advance towards universal coverage by providing that support to transition to a full NHI. So you expand coverage, you increase access, you reduce out of pockets, you develop your single payer system. This is what we are here to do. And some of the core activities which we have that we'll be engaging, defining that burden of disease. If you want to link your package of services to health needs, let's define the needs much more tightly. Second thing we want to do is in relation to the package. Let's define the package. At the moment, there are a number of things which are being offered in the public sector, the private sector, the non-governmental organizations, international organizations sometimes coming here to offer services. We want to put, look at all of these and see what is the most appropriate package for Antigua and Barbuda given the burden of disease that you have in the population. The third dimension, the third aspect of our work is to try to make sure that having defined the package and uh, pointed out that all persons should have access to the package, how do we relate to the financing side? What are the financing options? Is it going to be more money from people's pockets? Is it going to be other types of arrangements that we put inside of there? Is it going to be more efficiency in our operations? How does that fit into the overall macroeconomic and macro social uh, setting that we have? And that's part of that third uh, major task that we'll be engaged in so that you get the right fit. Financing option related to macro social developments, related to the package and your burden of disease. The fourth dimension of this is that we really want to make sure that the legal framework, the policy, the regulatory, the legal sides of this are in place. Professor Tedder pointed out that for you to have a system that is visible, that is transparent, that is accountable, it has to be rooted in legislation and regulation. And that's what we want to build into this. How do you administer this? Does the current administrative arrangement at the MBS, is that adequate or does it have to be changed or modified and how do we begin 
to draw attention to what are the critical aspects of that overall governance and organizational structure that will be needed for these. And lastly, in all of this, as uh, Dr. Cumberbatch and Bo uh, Professor Tiada pointed out, that whole matter of the information system. So really, we, we will be working on six major components of what you want to do during the course of our work. We'll be interacting, we'll be sharing information, we'll be bringing data sets from other countries within the Caribbean, from elsewhere. Because we have also done work with the WHO, with PAHO, with the World Bank, we'll be bringing all of those resources into the mix so that we can share that information, we can build on what you have, we can fill the gaps, and all together we can do a a major exercise for the government and people of Antigua and Barbuda to move you towards the road of universal health coverage. The plan then, the plan then is for us to have a made in Antigua and Barbuda for Antigua and Barbuda plan. Thank you much. Mr. Kevin Silston is an economist by profession with more than 20 years of experience working in the areas of economics and finance. He is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Medical Benefit Scheme, a public corporation primarily responsible for financing health care in Antigua and Barbuda. His prior, prior to this, his appointment, uh, he works for, he worked for five years, sorry, as an advisor to the Executive Directors for Canada. Ireland and the Caribbean at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in Washington, D.C., USA. He also has previous experience working as a senior economist in the research department of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and as a macroeconomic advisor and deputy financial secretary at the Ministry of Health. Sorry, Ministry of Finance in Antigua and Barbuda. Could you please welcome Mr. CEO Kevin Silston, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. Honorable Minister of Health, Wellness and Environment. Malvin Joseph, Mr. John Carrot, PS, Ministry of Health. Dr. C.D. Thomas, Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Duncan, Medical Director, and all the other technicians and doctors from the Mount St. John's Medical Center. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sean Sinner, Chairman of the Mount St. John's Medical Center. Mr. Hewitt, Power Representative. Um, Senator Osbert Frederick, I think I saw him. And the other members of the Board of the Medical Benefit Scheme. Professor Theodore and the team from the University of West Indies Health Economics Unit. Other senior public officials, members from the Medical and Nursing Fraternity. Other key stakeholders, media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Right, I, given the quality of the presentations, I'm not sure that there's much more for me to say here. I do want to start by just um, piggybacking on a point that the minister made uh, when he was answering a question about how do we go about facilitating the process of financing. And I want to say that it's an integrated process an integrated process, much more than just the, minute, uh, the Mount St. John's and um, MBS and the government indeed. But when, when you say the government, it, it, it's, it's much broader than that. It requires us to have more, more, almost a seamless relationship in terms of how we actually engage. Whether it be we are calling the Ministry of Finance or calling the Pierce from the Ministry of Health, of Health the, um, Mr. Attil, calling Mr. Attil, calling Mount St. John's Medical Centers, either going to the doctors. And I can well imagine that if on my side we're dealing with the financing options for the technicians, the nurses, the doctors, it's actually a much more critical issue, even engaging getting with the minister. And I don't want us to lose that point. There's a lot that goes behind every person that has to fly out for medical treatment. Whether it be on a weekend, you're getting a message from the minister or someone else that we have a situation that we need to move now. It means me texting Dr. Duncan at 11 at night or 6 in the morning and expect him to answer at that point. 
and this is critical because we always have, have to be on guard us engaging with the folks in the finance department of the ministry uh, of MBS saying that this is not protocol, but let's do this and we will clean this up afterwards. This is critical and I think that we just, just need to bear that in mind that as we build this integrated system that we're talking about, we're not losing sight of what we already have in place. Um, the success of any great project actually starts with a vision. And in this instance, what we're talking about is health, the well-being of a population, here, we're talking about our nation. This is a key pillar component in any development process. There's no economic powerhouse, there's no economic activity, growth in economic activity without a healthy population. With respect to the vision, I am proud that 40 years ago, the government of Antigua and Barbuda had the foresight to establish the medical benefit scheme, a system of socialized health care to cater for the masses and allow them to access health care without facing financial hardship. And you can well imagine that in 1978, we weren't even independent as yet. It means that we had a significant amount of people who fall within this working class mass that could not afford health care. And having a collective responsibility in how we do that, how we cater for people's lives, was actually important. I just returned from um, a financing conference in, 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 um, in Anguilla. I remember, I wouldn't call the country, but one of the other countries, they were saying to me, I mean, how are things going in Antigua? Um, when we have finished our consultation, we're just waiting, you know, to figure out how, how we actually roll it out. And I said to him, you know, we're doing fine. I, I didn't want to say to him that you're just coming to the party. <laughs> you're really just coming to the party. We've started. He said, I heard you're having some problems. I said, you know, you know, we're doing fine. We're doing fine. MBS. MBS have actually served us well. They've served us well thus far. But as time change, we must also evolve and meet what are now new and daunting challenges associated with changes in disease burdens and access to modern healthcare services. The discussion this morning and from the questions that I've seen here, it begs the question as to what would this transformation look like? What will MBS look like next week? What it will look like next year? And this is why we're here. This is why we're here, this is why you are here, and this is why we're engaging. We have heard a number of buzzwords this morning. Universal health care, national health insurance, health system, costing and financing structure, legal framework, service delivery, service standards, health, health information system, and what is critical as well, safeguarding individual health and the process associated or dealing with that specific thing. Our goal is to engage with you, the stakeholders, and the population in an open and transparent manner and to come up with a structure, a framework for delivering affordable health care in a cost-effective manner for all citizens of Antigua and Barbuda, but it will be unique to us. We have had 40, 40 years of experience in doing something. And the original design of MBS in 1978 is not where we are now. We have evolved, we have morphed into doing other things. We are now financing other type of arrangement. We are now outsourcing different type of care, orthopedic care. Um, different um, structure that we're actually looking at. Minister mentioned, I think the CMO mentioned that we're looking at now engaging with cardiac care. These are things that we've been doing, not in our original mandate, but you know, usually when you have a job description, it says that it depart, I mean, any other services or any other duties, and the minister has been using that to full effect. <laughs> but I must say, I, I cannot disagree with his position. I mean, I've heard him making a couple of points in in Parliament one time about trying not to shirk the responsibility of providing service or, or access to anyone. And suffice it to say, notwithstanding the mandate or the extended mandate of MBS, what we have seen is going towards making the health system better. And that I can certainly appreciate. And thank you very much, <laughs> Minister, for that. So we are not really sure what the final product of this MBS will look like. Uh, we are at the beginning of the work, the beginning of the consultancy, and that's why our able consultants from the University of West Indies are here. But again, I want to reiterate the point made by the minister and the CMO that we will be col collaborating in a transparent and open process, and we will engage the stakeholders and the wider population in every set of the way. As the minister mentioned, we are putting the necessary structures in place to support the work of the consultants. 
Similarly, we are setting up parallel committees at the Ministry of Health. Um, MBS will do so as well at Mount St. John's <laughs> Medical Center to monitor the work and the output of the consultants and to look at what is required for us to change to accommodate this transformation into universal health care that we are actually talking about. Um, and I, I just want to make a couple of final points. Now, the initial vision back in 1978 looked like something. It evolved into the MBS. What we are seeing now is a new vision or update to that vision, and that vision is being led by our minister. I remember coming back from the, um, the IMF World Bank, and I was actually just about to leave. Um, I was about to go to work for Kartak, and the minister called, Prime Minister called, and said, where are you going? We have work here to do. Why don't you come and do some work here? And I went to the minister's office, and he gave me this speech. He told me that he's, you know, not, it's not a political statement, but he, he told me this thing about him coming, being in the U.S., having, uh, be, having a, 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 um, opportunities to stay on that side, but making the decision to come back to Antigua. And we had a conversation about where he wants to take the healthcare system and this transformation of national health care, uh, MBS into, into um, national health in insurance. And I bought into that vision. Now, I've made several stops on my career, but I can say and I can testify that this has been the most meaningful part of my career. There's... Sorry for the folks on finance. Now, there's one thing about us looking at macroeconomic stability, dealing with numbers, checking numbers. And you know, they used to call me the tax man at a different time in my life. Um, although this is important, what the transformation has shown me is that every decision that you make about increasing a tax or cutting a tax, there is a body that is attached to that. It shows a transition between policy and service or policy and how that impacts on people and anyway and at MBS more than anywhere else I can see clearly decisions that we make how that impacts on the life of people whether or not we are at the Mount St. John's board discussing how we deal with the hospital treatment in care someone calling or coming into your office needing assistance and you need to move immediately I would not there's no other place that I'd rather be than here and to be a part of this process Minister thank you very much for your vision that you've shared and I can say and I think I can speak on behalf of all the other technicians and the healthcare uh, professionals, both at Ministry of Health, uh, in the ministry itself at the Mount St. John's, that we share a vision and we look forward to working with you to actually make this a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.